many of us have deceased sons, daughters, and relatives who died of cancer. I can think of no more worthy investment. I know of nothing that is more bipartisan. So let's end cancer as we know it. It's within our power. It's within our power to do it. Good morning. I'm Yasneen Abu Talib, a health policy reporter with The Washington Post. Welcome to this year's first Chasing Cancer event, where we're speaking with some of the biggest names in oncology about the nation's path forward in fighting this disease. My first guest today is Dr. Ned Sharpless, director of the National Cancer Institutes. Dr. Sharpless, welcome back to Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here today. Thanks for joining us. So I think we want to start with the National Cancer Act, which was signed into law 50 years ago. What progress has been made since then, and why was this pivotal in the country's mission to combat cancer? <clears throat> yeah, it, it, we're, we're, 1971 was the signature, so it, we, you know, we're a, a, a approaching the 50-year anniversary. And uh, certainly the National Cancer Act didn't start cancer research. The NCI, for example, was founded in 1937, but it really uh, accelerated it in a number of important ways. It, it gave the uh, National Cancer Institute some abilities to do special kinds of research, uh, like the Cancer Center Program and uh, the SEER database that we use for National Statistics Database. It provided additional funding for the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and, but I think most importantly, what it did is it made cancer a disease that we could talk about. It, it, it removed the stigma of this disease and it made it something that where we could have a national public conversation. And this has been incredibly meaningful for patients. And uh, you know that period then has really been marked by impressive progress in cancer research. We've seen declining cancer mortality, new uh, inno innovations in prevention and screening and treatment for cancer, and uh, you know a lot of progress against the disease over that period. It's important to say we still have a long way to go. We still have 600,000 Americans dying of cancer in the United States. So, you know, the 50th anniversary is turning out to be kind of a what I like to think of as a midway point. You know, I, I believe the time right now. We will think of this time as a real turning point in cancer research, a real golden age of cancer research, if you will, uh, because we can now make progress against that, you know, uh, the rest of the cancer deaths that we uh, still have a problem with the United States. So I, I hear you that the, the National Cancer Act is not when cancer research started, but since that's the time period we're looking at, what are some of the biggest points of progress you've seen over the last half century? And you mentioned we're in a, in a golden age. What, what exactly do you mean by that? So, so when I started in this business, you know, in the late 1990s, uh, 1990s, um, we thought of cancer as kind of like a handful of diseases. There was lung cancer, there was breast cancer, there was colon cancer. And, uh, and then we would do these clinical trials where we would give patients drugs and, uh, for their cancer and 20% of the patients would respond and 80% would not. And we would be puzzled by that. We would think, why does it work some of the time and not the rest of the time? And, and what became clear was that we were binning a bunch of different things together and calling them the same thing. So we, we called all breast cancer, breast cancer. And we've since in the last 20 years really appreciated that breast cancer isn't one disease or even five diseases. It's like tens or hundreds of diseases. And that's true for across all types of cancer. This heterogeneity of cancer turns out to be really important. And it's important to understand what caused the cancer, how you would prevent the cancer, how you would diagnose the cancer, and how you would treat the cancer. So every aspect of cancer research has been really changed dramatically by the understanding that cancers are almost virtually unique to every patient. And therefore, we can't think about it as a kind of one-size-fits-all problem. And once we bought into that paradigm, uh, progress in cancer has really been, been, been accelerated tremendously. So it's much easier to make progress against a, a, a small uh, subset of breast cancer that you understand really well in molecular terms than to try and take on everything at once with some sort of magical silver bullet approach. So that, that I think, the uh, appreciation for the heterogeneity of cancer has been the major paradigm shift of the last 50 years. Well, given the, the progress and the paradigm shift in the last 50 years, what are the points of progress you think we could see in the next 50? You know, President Biden has said he wants to end cancer as we know it. Given the, the the rapid progress that's been made over the last few decades, do you think that's possible in the next 50 years? Yeah, obviously, it's tremendously exciting for the cancer research community to have a president say, you know, in, in the House of Congress uh, about, uh, you know, this goal that we're going to end cancer as we know it. 
I, I think it's important to note the president didn't say he thought we were going to eradicate all cancer. That is uh, something that we think would be biologically very challenging. I, I, I think what we could do, though, is markedly reduce cancer suffering and cancer death. And I, I think we could do that. Uh, you know, it, as I said, the, the mortality of cancer has been declining for years, but we can accelerate that pace and have been in the last few years already. And this is due to lots of things. I mean, this is better prevention. So we've made a lot of progress with tobacco control and with vaccinations for hepatitis B and for HPV human papillomavirus. And that, that's, you know, led to a decreased burden of cancer. It's through better diagnosis of cancer and through screening for cancer with things like col colorectal cancer screening and mammography and lung cancer screening, and also with really improvements in, in treatment. But, you know, there will be no single thing that, you know, suddenly decreases cancer uh, across the waterfront. It will be this combination of, you know, prevention, screening, treatment, and survivorship where we make lots of progress against these small subsets of cancer continuously as we're doing now. And if you really look at where things are uh, going, uh, that's what we're seeing is that the, 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 these sort of very effective new therapies, for example, that work against a specific type of lung cancer or a new device that really helps with a specific type of uh, breast cancer, for example. So that 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 paradigm is starting to work. There's obviously been tremendous progress in the United States. Cancer survival rates have increased significantly since the 1970s, but it's uneven when you look across the globe, and that's not necessarily the case in many low and middle income countries. So can you give us a bit of a global perspective on cancer care and the let, help us understand the impact that the National Cancer Act might have had on cancer care, not just in the United States, but worldwide? Right. I think um, this is a very important point. It, it may surprise some to learn that cancer is becoming a a tremendous global health, public health problem as well. And in many low and middle income countries, cancer is becoming a, a really important cause of mortality and a, an important cause of suffering. And, and we at the National Cancer Institute seeing, you know, reducing cancer suffering worldwide as part of our mission. And we have a center for global health that was started by my predecessor, Harold Varmus, to really take on these issues and, and facilitate the cancer research that can benefit all populations throughout the globe. Uh, the, the, the problems differ somewhat, you know, so tobacco control is a problem uh, worldwide, but then there are, you know, issues like cervical cancer, where we've made a lot more, a lot of progress in the United States and in affluent countries because of screening for cervical cancer and HPV vaccination. But that's still a huge problem in many low and middle income countries where implementation of these effective approaches is a, is a, is a challenge. So it's an important uh, research question is how to best do cancer prevention and control in low and middle income settings. And that's that's a, a preeminent interest of the NCI. But I, I do think that we uh, at the NCI believe this is part of our mission is to end cancer suffering for all humans, no matter where they live. And uh, I think that's, you know, the, 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 the things that we're developing that work in, a, in an affluent country like the United States, many of them are exportable and directly beneficial to uh, other settings as well. So let's let's talk a little bit about the the new administration. Obviously, you've, you've served across a number of administrations, but as you mentioned, you, there is a president now where cancer and cancer care is very near and dear to his heart. He has personal experiences with it. Um, he's called on Congress to advance cancer research and funding, and a, like we were talking about earlier, to end cancer as we know it. On when we're looking at Congress, do you see bipartisan compromise or ability to compromise on on those fronts, or are those discussions happening? Yeah. So, so, um, so you know, uh, since entering federal government in 2017, I have been repeatedly impressed by the strong bipartisan support for cancer research that exists in Congress. You know, I, I've yet to meet a legislator who doesn't think that uh, funding cancer research is a good use of federal funds. It's, I think, something that kind of everybody agrees is a national need and an area where, uh, you know, appropriated funds can be very, very helpful. And, and, and generally, the, you know, legislators tell me they'd like to do more for, you know, basic science research and for cancer research. So uh, I, I think there's, uh, this is a place where we can have a, a very good and frank conversation that's bipartisan in nature. And certainly uh, at a recent appropriations hearing where I testified, you know, that, that spirit was very much alive where, where members from both sides of the aisle uh, really remarked on uh, how uh, successful cancer research has been in some ways and what a good investment it's been for Congress, but also how there's still a lot more we need to do. And it's not time to let up and and, and uh, not not really continue to press our advantage against, you know, against cancer. Well, I think we'll be eager to see what some of those discussions and conversations manifest in. 
Um, you've also done some recent events with First Lady Jill Biden. She, of course, is also a, a big cancer advocate, given their family's experience with it. Can you tell us a little bit of what those conversations with her have been like? And what do you think the two of you can accomplish by working together? Right. Uh, First Lady Biden has made this uh, clear that cancer uh care and cancer progress is one of her top priorities. And, and uh, we, you know, again, it's just uh, wonderful to have an administration that backs uh, that uh, so so forcefully. Uh, she has um, spoken a lot about losing family members to cancer and then having friends who've been diagnosed with cancer. And I think she has uh, been a wonderful uh, spokesperson for, you know, why this is still a problem and why we, we need to make progress. I think that she... Um, uh, w when she first, her first visit was to the National Cancer Group, one of her first visits uh, virtually, and it was really to thank the NCI for the uh, hard work uh, the staff here had done during the pandemic. It's been very difficult uh, to work under the, you know, in the disruptive uh, situation of the pandemic, but I think that um, cancer research, despite, you know, the challenges of 2020, has been very productive in, 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 in recent years, including 2020. And so uh, First Lady Biden wanted to convey that sense of gratitude, which was really, uh, really wonderful at the NCI. It's a, it's a hardworking group of, of federal officials who really uh, appreciate that uh, support and sentiment. Uh, Dr. Biden has also spoken a bit about, um, you know, recovering from the pandemic. So we missed all these cancer screenings. A lot of mammograms didn't happen. A lot of colonoscopy didn't happen. We, cancers were not diagnosed and cancer care was delayed. And so, you know, Dr. Biden is, uh, like many of us, concerned about how we recover from the pandemic and get back to making progress against cancer and not, you know, disrupt that great trend of decreasing mortality I spoke about. Well, I, I want to ask a little bit more about that because the last time you were here, you had expressed some concern that there could be a significant number of delayed screenings and then that could result in, um, I think, 10,000 undiagnosed cases. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm misrepresenting that. How how has that panned out? Have your have your fears manifested? Has it been more or less than you expected? But what has been the impact of delayed screenings during the pandemic? Right. So you're alluding to some modeling we did early on in the pandemic. You know, within months of it starting, about what would be the impact if uh, you know people stopped getting cancer screenings and stopped getting routine cancer care. And and we made some what we thought were like kind of worst case assumptions, like maybe we reduce mammography by seventy five percent. And it turned out that most of our, our worst case scenarios were low balls. It's actually worse than we expected. So we've seen, you know, across the board, you know, 95% declines in various kinds of cancer, cancer screening, mammography, lung cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, and pap smears for cervical cancer. And uh, we've also seen delayed diagnosis. So patients, you know, the incidence of diagnosis of cancer has declined uh, sort of for a couple months during the pandemic by 50%. There's no reason to believe true cancer incidents went down by 50%. We think that's just people who weren't going to the doctor or weren't getting routine care. And we believe many of those cancers are just going to be diagnosed now at later stages. So I think the worst fears of the NCI were confirmed. And now we're seeing that clearly in the data. But um, what we don't know yet is what this is going to turn out to in mortality. You know, if this is going to be uh, lead to adverse outcomes for patients. And I, I think there has been this real collective uh, action by the uh, cancer care community, by hospitals and societies like the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Cancer Society, and uh, caregivers and patient, patient groups to really try and, you know, galvanize, work together and, and, and make the impact of the pandemic as least bad as possible. So getting patients back for screening, getting care back on track. And uh, so we, we will have to see over the next, it'll take, you know, years, perhaps even a decade, to really understand the impact of the pandemic and this, these delayed screenings on cancer mortality. But we definitely have seen a bigger impact on terms of screening and care than we expected at the beginning of the pandemic. And as I said, we thought those were sort of worst case scenarios when we modeled them. Well, as you just articulated, of course, despite the, the pandemic and everything the country was dealing with, these issues with cancer care, delayed screenings didn't go away. And we know that President Biden had a lot on his plate when he came into office. You know, there was the vaccine rollout. He's garnering, trying to garner bipartisan support for various legislative efforts. You've been able to talk to First Lady Jill Biden. Have you gotten to speak with the president about your priorities and what the National Cancer Institute needs for its success? What, what does it need? Is it more funding? Is there is there something beyond that? Um, and and have you been able to to get the president's ear on that yet? Right. I have not spoken to President Biden on this topic, but uh, I 
Eric Lander, uh, the, who the new Senate confirmed cabinet member or a member of the cabinet and director of OSTP, is uh, someone we've spoken to at length and I think is really talking to the president about cancer research opportunities and I think is a uh, uh, someone who knows cancer research quite well and is a, is a you know a genomics researcher by training and so certainly a, a real friend of the National Cancer Institute I think is a good person to represent uh, the NCI's interests in this topic along with Francis Collins director of the NIH so I, I think the president is hearing from plenty of really good people about uh, the needs in cancer and I've certainly made my uh, interests and desires about cancer research very clear to Eric and, and, and Francis. And we've talked about screenings, but another equally important part of, of this discussion is, of course, prevention. Um, and there are a number of things people know fairly widely that they should do for, and to prevent cancers, you, to not smoke, to eat healthy, to take care of themselves. Um, but are there other ways to think about prevention? Are there some new innovative technologies on the horizon when it comes to prevention or screening that, that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot going on here that I think is very exciting. Um, uh, and it, it sort of spans this gamut of prevention and screening and, and, and bends them together a little bit. But for example, the uh, ability to detect, early, detect cancer earlier using a for example, a blood test, these so-called multi-cancer early detection tests, what you would do in a healthy person who would go in to their doctor, you know, say once every other year, or once a year, once they were above a certain age, and uh, would just have a tube of blood removed. And, and, and from that, you know, uh, could be screened for multiple cancers at once. I, I think those technologies are really promising. And uh, while they're still in the experimental stage, in my, in my mind, they uh, have the potential to really affect cancer uh, mortality if they work as well as they appear to. So that's a, a, an important new area. I think the adoption of, of vaccines is still a, a, an emerging story uh, internationally now. And we, we now have clear data, for example, that the HPV vaccine, which was in part developed at the National Cancer Institute, uh, is effective in reducing cervical cancer and other HPV-associated cancers like uh, head and neck cancer, which is the uh, HPV-associated head and neck cancer, which is the fastest growing cancer in incidence in the United States in men. Uh, so, you know, that that dissemination of that uh, at greater scale could prevent a lot of uh, cancer. I think tobacco control has been a, a good story over the last few decades, but we still have a long way to go in tobacco control. There's still too many people smoking combustible cigarettes in the United States. The one area that worries me the most here, frankly, is around obesity. It's clear that obesity causes or is strongly associated, perhaps in a causative manner, with many types of cancer. And those are the cancers in the United States that we're seeing increase in incidence and increase in mortality are predominantly the ones associated with obesity. And, uh, and uh, there's, as you know, a national epidemic of obesity. And this will uh, continue to play out in terms of worsening cancer statistics if we don't you know, collectively do something about that as a country. I, I do think there are some new technologies in uh, obesity research and, and maintenance of obesity and, and, and sort of to, to treat obesity that I think may uh, be a benefit at a population level. And so I think that is an area where uh, there is some exciting science going on as well. So we only have about a minute left, so I want to make sure we get in an audience question. This is from um, Aaron Corral in Arizona. How will biotechnologies like mRNA reshape the development of oncology drugs? Yeah, this is a great question. I think um, uh, it's probably not known to a lot of people that Moderna, the company behind uh, the mRNA vaccine, one of the mRNA vaccines for COVID, uh, started out as a cancer company and had uh, therapeutic trials and still has therapeutic trials uh, for, for uh, vaccines, of personalized vaccines using the mRNA approach to treat cancer. That's a very exciting idea that a platform that's versatile like mRNA, where you can sort of make different treatments for different people uh, to give them the vaccine that they specifically need for their cancer, that that might be a way to sort of awaken the immune system and uh, help uh, treat patients with cancer. So we believe uh, the mRNA platform has a, is very exciting and should be explored for cancer research. Uh, and there are other sort of platform technologies like that, where, uh, you know, the ability to make more and more personalized therapies that are almost, you know, tailored for the individual patient, the, the, the ability of these platforms to do that could be very good for patients. I think we could talk about this for hours, but unfortunately we're out of time for today. Dr. Sharpless, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be, it's, it's always good to come. Please stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. I'll be with CNN reporter and cancer advocate, Andrew Kaczynski after this.
Good morning. My name is Dave Fredrickson, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Oncology Business Unit at AstraZeneca. The National Cancer Act was signed 50 years ago this year. It's an incredible time to reflect on the tremendous progress in oncology research and development, as well as in early stage cancer diagnosis, treatment, and care. One of the most important advances during this period has been the true revolution in precision medicine. This has become more important than ever because no two cancer diagnoses are the same, and we must ensure that the right patients are receiving the right cancer treatments at the right time. The next phase of advancing precision medicine and oncology requires deep interdisciplinary partnerships to ensure patient-centric, coordinated care is based on the latest science. I'm thrilled to be here today as part of AstraZeneca's Your Cancer Program. We believe that redefining cancer care for patients requires going beyond just our medicines and involves close collaboration with the broader cancer community to pursue the common goal of eliminating cancer as a cause of death. Today, we wanna to recognize one of those organizations at the very forefront of cancer care. I have here with me today, Dr. Lee Beamer, Chief Medical Officer of the Association of Community Cancer Centers, or ACCC. Dr. Beamer is one of the leading national experts working to strengthen comprehensive oncology education programs to meet the rapidly evolving needs of healthcare professionals in communities across the country. Dr. Beamer, welcome. It's great to have you here and let's get started. How do you see cancer care changing due to the role of precision medicine, both today and evolving in the future, and maybe especially in light of what we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic? It's a pleasure to be here and thanks very much, Dave. I think the rate of change in the last 50 years in oncology has been staggering, to say the least. And I think first and foremost, I believe that we need to continue educating interdisciplinary teams to strive toward and then advocate for a system that truly recognizes that all cancer care should be equitable cancer care. And so if we look at just one facet of precision medicine, comprehensive and earlier biomarker testing, that's become standard of care for many cancer subtypes in response to this amazing revolutionary growth of targeted therapies. But many patients across the country aren't receiving guideline concordant care, and that's due to a lot of issues, health literacy, navigation concerns, financial toxicity, just to name a few. So a truly, as you said, interdisciplinary approach, including reimbursement for quality cancer care is gonna be critical as we look ahead to the next 50 years. And I think finally, in order to ease the integration of some of those new and innovative approaches to precision medicine, ACCC has developed an oncology practice transformation and integration center, which we call OPTIC. And this network of community oncology clinicians and projects really focuses on supporting successful and safe adoption and adaptation then of all of the new precision medicine advancements so that patients can really remain in their communities for cancer care wherever possible. Thanks, Dr. Beamer. I think the role that the ACCC plays and the role that communities play in ensuring that outstanding care can be delivered in the community and not just in certain centers that are located in, in certain cities across right. the United States is so essential. And, and, and I think that the notion of being able to have outstanding outcomes for all patients equitably is something that we are certainly energized about. I think if I move on to a, a second portion of this, um, and, and you highlight some of this in the conversation that we had before, but we've seen some worrisome declines in cancer screening and diagnosis as a result of COVID-19. Can, can you share how the ACCC is working to strengthen and expand quality cancer care moving forward? You talked about OPTIC, but maybe there's some other dimensions here. What have we learned that will help us to reimagine the future of cancer care? Absolutely. You know, and we too share the concern about the drop in screening and the potential for later stage diagnoses as we continue to move through the pandemic era. So one of the ways that ACCC is really trying to highlight these concerns is through community oncology research. And ACCC believes that community oncology belongs in cancer research 
and then cancer research belongs in community oncology programs and practices. So to help bridge the gap in cancer research and recognizing the support of, as we are alluding, many pandemic era flexibilities introduced, ACCC launched the Community Oncology Research Institute, or ACORI, and it was really designed to facilitate equity in care and to assist in building research capacity and sharing effective practices and knowledge. And a hybrid approach of in-person and virtual healthcare as we move forward has also been suggested by many in the adult education industry as the new norm. And so ACCC has really focused a lot of time and energy on the democratization of digital technology knowledge and certainly implementation tips. And I think this is really a wonderful way for everyone to highlight the role of the caregiver as vital member of the cancer care team and acknowledge the assistance that they've provided many who are navigating the pandemic with a diagnosis of cancer. And then finally, COVID-19 has also further illuminated existing disparities in cancer care. And we've seen this especially for underserved patient populations. So ACCC has embarked on multiple projects aimed at trying to identify challenges and practical solutions, because it's not just about barriers, for equitable offering of biomarker testing and shared decision-making, and then of course, comprehensive care coordination. Well, that's actually quite a lot that you are working on within that. I think that uh, um, the role that you talk about the caregiver is one that I'm particularly pleased to hear. I, I know that as we've worked on our own program of New Normal Same Cancer, one of the things that we've really tried to do is co-create with patient coalitions that includes a, a thought for those caregivers around how we can actually encourage people to get back to care and make sure that they're not letting the pandemic result in collateral damage. Uh, in the form of, of, of cancer outcomes. Well, I really want to thank you so very, very much for uh, the time that we had today. Just maybe uh, as, as I close, as we recognize the progress of the last 50 years following the National Cancer Act being signed into law and reflect on the courage and dedication of our healthcare community during these unprecedented times, I'm certainly hopeful that we'll emerge from the pandemic stronger with a renewed sense of purpose and indeed an imperative to redefine cancer care. To learn more about our commitment to catalyze change alongside the oncology community, please visit yourcancer.org. Thank you to the Washington Post for hosting this timely forum and to Dr. Beamer for our enlightening discussion and the incredible work he and the ACCC do to improve quality of life for people affected by cancer. And now I'll turn it back over to the Washington Post. We didn't know what to do. Um, and from there, just so many people who had kids with ATRT reached out to us. Now I feel like, for me at least, it's important to, for people to know about children with cancer. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Yasmina Boutalib, a health policy reporter with The Washington Post. My next guest is CNN reporter and pediatric cancer advocate, Andrew Kaczynski. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. A lot of us last year became familiar with Francesca's story as you were sharing it on Twitter, helping us understand what life was like for you and your family. But I think some of our viewers might not be aware of, as aware of her story. So can you walk us through it a little bit? How did you get Francesca's diagnosis and what did you learn about what her treatment options were? So the way Francesca was diagnosed was 
you know, she was six months old. Uh, our life began that day in September of 2020. Uh, it was Labor Day weekend, um, and it kind of started like any other day. We went for a walk. Um, there was not a cloud in the sky. It was beautiful. Um, and the next day, she or th that evening, she just started vomiting uh, and wouldn't stop. And we took her to the uh, a pediatric urgent care. Uh, by us, and they told us that she just had uh, a stomach bug, and it just it did it didn't feel right for us. Um, you know, her eyes were kind of wandering all over the place. She seemed really lethargic. She would not hold uh, anything down. Um, so we just trusted our gut, and we took her to the pediatric emergency room by our home at midnight. And immediately, the doctor said to me, uh, said to us, you know, I don't like the way your daughter's head looks. I don't like uh, the size of it. I don't like the way her eyes are wandering. And she did an MRI and we were thinking, you know, this lady is crazy. Francesca is a big baby. But she immediately came back to us and said, your child has a mass on their brain. It's probably a brain tumor and it's probably cancer. Uh, and for me, at least, my life was and our lives were just completely shattered in that moment. And I've said before, but Francesca's death is not the worst moment of our life. That moment is the worst moment of our life because that's the moment that everything changed for us, at least. Uh, we were transferred, you know, in an ambulance into the city and she had to have emergency surgery because the tumor was so big, it was blocking the flow of fluid in her brain and she could have very well died uh, within hours. And they did an emergency surgery uh, to save her life and they helped her drain the fluid. Uh, and that was basically the start of this journey for us. I, I know that both you and your wife are journalists. Rachel's a, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Um, research is a huge, part of our jobs. So I imagine when you get a diagnosis like this, which of course is, is unbelievably devastating, there's this dichotomy of wanting to know everything you possibly can, consult with all the best experts, get as much research as you can about what her options are. But on the other hand, because of how rare her cancer is and the limited treatment options, that it's it's, it's hard to, to understand the landscape. So what did you guys learn in that and and how did you how did you deal with it so francesca went in on that saturday actually sunday morning for uh and had her emergency surgery the next day we found out um afterwards that it was uh you know a very aggressive form of cancer but we didn't have the pathology report back we she had another surgery the next day to put in a shunt, which is basically a device which takes the fluid that's blocked by the tumor and puts it back into your, your body through your stomach. Um, and we were discharged by Wednesday, uh, waiting the pathology report. Um, you know, we spoke to a ton of surgeons and ton of doctors uh, before we got the pathology. And then, you know, once we did, I was devastated like I when they told us that it was the it was ATRT I literally threw up the second the man said atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor I threw up my wife had to take the phone um I just held Francesca and I I was crying and I told her how sorry I was um and I basically said to her um that you know we figured out we didn't know what we had to do. I don't know if people remember, but I put out a tweet Saturday the next morning at 11 a.m. telling about the diagnosis. And because we didn't know what to do, we had to, like, we were just, there's so little research on infant brain tumors that we didn't know what to do. There wasn't information readily available. And I just thought, you know, we have to crowdsource this and get as much information as we can. And 
from there, we learned about the few experts in the world about this. We talked to all of them. Um, and within a week had to ch up, you know, take our lives and move to Boston for treatment because that was where we thought that Francesca would probably have the best shot. You know, I, I've seen you talk a lot about the fact that people who don't have um, who, who don't have to deal with this really don't understand what it is families like yours have to deal with. So I think a lot of us would really like to understand. You've, of course, talked about the diagnosis, the, the yeah. lack of resources available when you find out. But can you just tell us what the day to day was like for you and Francesca and Rachel in the hospital? And I mean, what was a what was a good day versus a bad day? So when your child has cancer, there actually is unfortunately no typical day because especially with a with you know a childhood brain cancer, just to give you an idea, when we went up to Boston that day, her initial shunt that was put in got infected and she got meningitis and they had to do emergency surgery. 3 a.m. the day we got to Boston, we had to take her right to the emergency room and they had to take it out. Uh, and then we had to make a decision and we were in the ICU about what we wanted to do uh, in terms of the surgery because you got to do something because the tumor is so aggressive. And so we went ahead and we did surgery and it was extremely successful as it could be to get as much of the tumor out as possible. And we finally got out of the ICU and when we got down to the oncology floor, that night Francesca started having seizures uh, and we had to go right back up to the ICU. Uh, when we were, you know, finally sort of got settled in, there's this routine, at least when you're in the hospital of, you get in there, you start the chemo with Francesca's tumor, it goes on for about, five or six days of actually getting the chemo, which for these kids is, you know, adult drugs that have been repurposed because they don't make kids cancer drugs. Um, and it's the toughest chemo they can get. So after about five or six days, they get really, really, really sick. Um, you have to watch your kid during these, you know, week, be it two weeks that their white blood cell counts go down from the chemotherapy. They're incredibly sick. They're vomiting, they're sleeping, they have so much mucus that they need to be suctioned. They're in horrible pain. Um, and then they come out of it and you're really happy. You might get a few days out of the hospital and then you start it all over again. And when you're out of the hospital, you have to be prepared to go back to the hospital the second they spike a fever. And you have to be very close to a hospital in case there's any emergency. So the unfortunate thing is, I mean, there's not really typical days. There's, there's the cycles and you just sort of have to be prepared for anything. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's emotionally draining. It's, I think about how hard it was on me to watch it. And then I think about what Francesca had to go through, you know, like the Francesca was a smiley, happy kid. Uh, she had the most infectious smile in the world, but it is, it's tough because she, she did suffer a lot. Um, and all of these kids suffer a lot. And it's, it's, it's really hard because I didn't get involved in, you know, the advocacy aspect of it until Francesca died. And then you, you learn what you have, you learn and, you know, it, it makes me angry. It makes you angry because you know that we're not, we're not doing enough. And if people could sort of like experience that feeling of, I didn't even get to when she was in the ICU when she died, you know, because we give these kids such harsh drugs. The side effects are terrible. Even if you do survive, they all have long-term problems. Many of the, most of the kids have long-term issues from it. But with Francesca, she got an infection from the treatment. 
because of how you know low her blood counts were and that and she died and we had to watch her slowly die in the ICU and and then you know you learn about everything that's going on and it just makes you so freaking angry that we're not putting our best foot forward for these kids you've really helped us understand just in a small way what what you have to endure and on top of all of that there's of course these enormous financial costs that come with the treatments and the surgeries and and just the state of perpetual uncertainty you're living in. You and, and Rachel had help. There was a GoFundMe set up for you. Um, you know, there were fundraising efforts. But what did it teach you about how much families have to figure out on their own when when their child is diagnosed with something like this and, and the disparities in, in cancer care if you're not lucky enough to have the financial means or someone who maybe sets up a GoFundMe for you. Yes. Oh, there are so many hidden costs to childhood cancer. Everybody, you know, talks about insurance. Okay. But it's not just insurance. I, I'm very fortunate that I had very good insurance through CNN and the biggest financial burden and cost for us was having to get up and move our lives to Boston, which was extremely expensive. But there are all these other costs associated with it. Caring for a sick child, or you know, if your child finishes care, a disabled child, a child that has to do physical therapy. Francesca spent months on, of her life just sitting on her back in a hospital bed. Um, there are these huge costs that you deal with you know, there's not just financial, there's obviously the, the emotional, but you have to get up and move for care immediately if you want to give your kid the best shot. Um, parents have to quit their job. It is a full-time job to care for a child with cancer. Uh, one of us was in the hospital with Francesca at all time. My wife had to take leave. I had to walk to and from Boston Children's twice a day one of us spent the night in the hospital every night. Sometimes it was my wife, sometimes it was me. But all of these costs, I mean, if you don't have the resources that we had, are just incredibly burdensome for all these families. Because GoFundMe's do help, but Francesca's care in total, paid, we, she had $3 million paid out by insurance for the cost of her cancer care. And Francesca was in the hospital from September until she died on Christmas Eve. What is that? Four months. That's $3 million. I mean, imagine how this will financially ruin someone who doesn't, if they don't have insurance, if they don't have good insurance. Uh, you have to deal with all of the costs of taking leave or quitting your job. And then you have to deal with the costs that are just associated with it, which is just going to and from the hospital moving for, for care, um, and I mean, everything else, if you have other kids, you have to find people to watch them while you care for the kid. It's, it's, it's emotionally, it's financially, I, just this huge burden on all of these families. And you, you've taken that experience, everything that you had to endure and channeled it into advocacy. I can see you're wearing your Team Beans t-shirt. Your Twitter bio says you're a dad fighting on, on behalf of Francesca for Team Beans. You, you've obviously learned so much no parent wants ever wants to have to find out through this experience. And you talked earlier about you know how angry it makes you, just how few treatment options there are, how little research there is on this. What did you learn about what needs to be done for pediatric cancer research? what's needed in terms of funding, in terms of expertise, and, and the, a lot of the issues that your advocacy is focused on now. I mean, how long do you have? I think we have a, uh, maybe a few more minutes. Okay, so I, I've referred to sort of what we uh, talked to about with Francesca as the worst reporting project ever when she was diagnosed. But after she was treated, I sort of learned, or after she, she passed away and I got involved and I wrote that op-ed for the Washington Post, I, I you know, interviewed oncologists, um, experts, advocates, parents, um, 
and you learned each person I talked to said this was the problem and this was the problem and this was the problem. And I learned how with childhood cancer, we sort of have to come at this with like a hammer and a nail. And basically there is the aspect of, um, you know, there's the funding issue, which it's severely underfunded. Uh, so many, uh, so much of the money raised for childhood cancer, as I mentioned, there are such a few, so many few kids that get cancer. I mean, it's 15,000, which like rare is only rare until it happens to you. Uh, but you have 200,000 cases of breast cancer a year. So pharmaceutical companies are not spending billions of dollars to develop rare cancer drugs. So where is that money coming from? The largest funder for childhood cancer is the federal government, and then it's followed by private charity, people like us, people like all of these amazing institutions which have raised millions of dollars. The other aspect is the lack of data. There's the lack of data. You know, what when Francesca was diagnosed, I would have loved to have known how many children who had metastatic ATRT at six months old lived or died. That data was not available to me. Um, there's, you know, the fact that, uh, we don't necessarily have resources for parents when they, when they first, you know, find out about their, their kid's diagnosis. Um, this is perhaps more of an institutional problem, but getting Francesca's medical records sent to all of the institutions was, I would describe it as a pain in the ass. I had to go down to the medical bright, you know, records room, and they could only give them to me on CD. They couldn't send them to the institution. So my child has a massive brain tumor, and she's, she's, you know, up against the clock, and I have to physically get the copies of the CDs and overnight them to hospitals across the country. Uh, you know, there's, it's just, it's, it's such a broad problem uh, that you have to come at each aspect individually. Uh, and that's what, you know, I've sort of decided I want to devote much of my life to doing. Well, I think, you know, the last thing that we want to ask you is, what do you want Francesca's legacy to be? You've obviously been an amazing parent to her and, and made sure that her, her memory stays alive. What do you want people to remember about her and, and what do you want her legacy to be from all of this? So Francesca will never get to live the life she deserved. And so many of these kids that we know will not get to live the lives they deserve. But their lives had purpose uh, and meaning. And part of why I'm continuing to do what I do is because I want Francesca's life to have served a purpose and I want her life to have had meaning. Um, I'll give you a quick story before we wrap up, which is I. I'm going to be running the Boston Marathon this year to benefit the Infant Brain Tumor Fund. And I started collecting names yesterday because on the back of my shirt, I want to put as many names of children with cancer that I can, who I'm running for. And just when I, I asked, you know, can I put your child's name on the back of my shirt? And when I put that out there, there must have been like, I already have like 80 names and it's not even been like 12 hours of kids that are fighting cancer who have died from cancer, or who I'm going to put on the back of the shirt that I'm running for. And I wish there weren't that many names, you know? I wish there weren't that many kids that had cancer and have died of cancer, because it changes your life. It changes your life. And you're never the same. You're never the same afterwards. You know, I've never been, you know, I haven't ha ever been viscerally happy since Francesca died. I can still, you know, have, have fun and, and do things, but I'll never be able to feel that same level of happiness because I always think about how Francesca won't have, get to live the life she deserved. <sighs> so I'm just, I'm fighting to do this because I'm still Francesca's dad and I'm doing it to <clears throat> make sure that her life had meaning. Well, Andrew, I just want to say personally, and I know so many people feel this way, thank you so much for sharing Francesca with us 
and keeping her alive and her story and letting us know who she was. I know she wasn't just a, a kid with cancer and and thank you for all your advocacy efforts and for being so open and sharing with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Please come back and join at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be looking at the Nat Geo documentary, uh, Tulsa, Rise Again, Tulsa and the Red Summer. I'm Yasmina Boutalib.